Hey guys, it's Kim aka Spartan Stitcher on Instagram and I am back again with another weekly cross stitching update. Today is the 1st of March 2021. This is video number 110 and I worked on four different pieces this week. Uh, we have one non-full coverage and then three full coverage. So uh, my non-full coverage I worked on was Halloween Rules by Lizzie Kate. And I got another rule done. This is on 28 Count Monaco that I rip dyed using the color Camel. And it's one over one. So I did carve a pumpkin and then a little bit more of the black border going down. So I am using all the DMC equivalents on this, not the fancy floss. All right. And there is one more rule. The next piece I worked on, I told you I had a thousand more stitches to, or ten stitches to do on Museum Shelf to finish up Like Water for Chocolate in the Bookshelf Challenge in Full Coverage Fanatics. And again, I'm right here on this last page of the dinosaurs on the lower level. So I only did a thousand ten stitches, but it filled in. So... Is more dark colors, so we filled in some of the the darkness in here, and then added more where the um, greenery and stones are going to be. So just kind of outlined those areas a little bit more. Twenty five count easy grid on my homemade PVC frame, and there's the entire piece so far. You get to keep looking at that one. So that was only a thousand ten stitches um and then let's see friday saturday sunday i kept working on or i kept working i picked up sunday delight by randall spangler i wanted to work on this the week prior but that got pushed off so i picked it up this week uh, i did 2610 stitches gotta remember i had like um Girl Scout cookie booths and stuff this weekend and some other things. So, uh, 2,610 stitches over three days. Um, I was going down the floss list, so it's really, I added colors all over. The page break is right about here. So, there's this page and then there's a separate page right here before you get to the partial page. So, I added in colors all over the place. The bowl, the ice cream, the cherries, the tabletop. This is a little swirl on the can of chocolate sauce. So getting closer to a page finish there. And then my daily piece. Um, I asked you last week if you thought I would get the muzzle done this week. And you should know. <laughs> when I ask you something, the, the answer to that is always like, yes, you'll get it done. Because I put my mind to it. And there were like two days where I worked more on Oh Baby than the other piece. Because, you know, I, I work a little bit every day on Oh Baby. But there was a couple days to ensure that I got the muzzle done where it got the majority of the time. And then the other piece got a little bit of time. So there's Oh Baby. This is a retired hay by Gelgash Taylor. Cropping off all this green. So I have it kind of halfway in the Q-snap so you can see it all. I finished. So I got the page finish because the muzzle covers two pages. Actually, two full pages and two partials. I got the page finish on the left side of his muzzle on the 27th and then the 28th, last day of February, I finished the muzzle. So I will show you the whole piece so far. This is 25 count Lugana. So there is the entire piece, and you can see all that I have left. So I've already moved the Q-snap over and gridded it. So there is a close-up of the pages I got done. So there's skinny partial down here, a, a little bit. I'm not counting this as a little partial page where I cropped it. So there's a big major page that comes like through this part of his nose. And so this page is already two-thirds of the way done. So I only have a third of a page to get 
this full page done and the middle partial and then we have one page and the skinny partial and then um there's like it's like 12 stitches wide there's a partial here and then the little tiny corner that's like one block 100 stitches or so for another page so I am at how many this I did 4,300 tent stitches this past week. So normally I do 2,000, 3,000 tent stitches a week. Um, so I did 4,300 tent stitches this past week. My total for the year so far is 28,000. I have, um, well, before, to, I already worked on it today. Um, all the threads that I had parked at the bottom of this page or, you know, top of these pages, I worked those in. So the only ones I didn't get to work in were these ones here at the bottom of the fence. So I've already put in 500 stitches on it today. And uh, so I did have 12,000 left. Take away 500 from that. Um, so 11,500 stitches left until a finish. So it will definitely be a finish in March. There's no question about it. I'm going to make sure that it happens. Um... Two weeks ago, I told you that I had finished out 35 colors out of the 83. Uh, last week, I didn't, I neglected to tell you I had finished two more colors. So last week, I was at 37 colors complete. Today, I'm at 47 colors complete out of the 83 in the chart. So we are more than halfway done with all the colors. And there's big blocks of color in here and then some, some, uh, other colors that get all scattered in there so that'll be should be quicker to work on so that is oh baby full coverage stitches uh for february i did twenty eight thousand nine hundred and twenty six tent stitches um two thousand full stitches on a summer ball so you convert everything to full stitches that brings a February total to 16,463 full stitches for the year to date for two months in full stitches, 35,703 stitches. So um, this is the start of History Sprints in Full Coverage Fanatics. This is our monthly event for March. It goes the entire month long. There are 20 dates of significant things in history that happened in March in different years. I am doing the counting, but I will be trying to match the theme on quite a few of them as well. So, for plans, what I'm going to be working on in March for History Sprints. Um, one of the events is about the founding of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So the theme is horses. So that one I'll definitely be doing the counting, but also matching the theme just as an extra challenge. Um, I will, since this is my 21 and 21 piece, you know, I'm double dipping between that and history sprints. So I will, um, after that horses event, I'll continue to, to count towards other um, events in the history sprints. I just don't know which ones yet. Just to keep double counting until I get to a finish or double dipping. Um, the other ones I'm going to use for history sprints, museum shelf. Um, because of the, uh, bookshelf challenge for March is also mysteries. So we have Rebecca, uh, the Da Vinci Code and, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. So I'd like to match the theme and do the counting for one of the books. So that one will be, uh, Trick or Treat because it's spooky scene. Um, and... For the other two books, I'm going to use Museum Shelf on the Da Vinci Code, and Rebecca is going to be on Friends Forever. So I kind of matched up the number of 10 stitches I have to do in the Bookshelf Challenge, along with picking a few of the historical events and history sprints to get close to the same amount of stitches um, for both. So I'm not doing a drastically different number of stitches for both events. But it's impossible to completely match them. So, um, on Museum Shelf, the uh, dates in history sprints that I'll be doing is for uh, concern with royalty because there is 
the top corner of the design is about English royalty. And I'm going to use it for books because lots of books. And also uh, there was a historical event about the Louvre and the uh, theme is art. So we have that one covered. So I'll be doing three history sprints on museum shelf and double counting those for the Da Vinci Code. On trick or treat, matching the, the mysteries theme um, and doing the stitches for murder on the Orient Express. And for history sprints, I'm going to use it for uh, the witches event for the Salem Witch Trials. And also uh, there's a historical event concerning the Wright Brothers. So something that flies because Trick or Treat has both a witch on a broom and bats. So I'm matching all those themes along with doing the counting. And for Friends Forever, I'm going to be doing Rebecca in the Bookshelf Challenge. And for History Sprints, I'm going to do, uh, there's one about Amelia Earhart, so the theme is a woman. Friends Forever has the elf woman on there. And then there's one with the um, patent for the cotton gin. So the theme is anything with clothing. Well, she's wearing clothing, so. And there's also cloth draped over her throne. So we'll be doing two History Sprints on that one. So I will at least be doing, oh, and then um, a summer ball, since I've been working on that every month. I didn't match the theme on this one since I used, I could have used it for the royalty slash England theme, but since I used that on museum shelf, um, I wanted to aim more for the stitch count because I try to get 2,000 stitches a month. So the uh, most current event in our history sprints is 1964 when the first Ford Mustang was uh, created. So I'll be doing the Mustang stitches on a summer ball. So I will at least get nine events, most likely more because of double dipping on Oh Baby. I just don't know which ones yet. Depends on the stitch counts since I won't be able to match all the themes. So that's my, you know, big angle plans for March. As for what I'll be working on this week, not entirely sure yet for sure oh baby um and then we'll see what else calls to me first between this museum shelf and trick-or-treat and friends forever i should probably pick up friends forever because it's been the one that hasn't been touched the longest um last stitching related thing is that i have hit 2,000 subscribers so thank you to everyone who has joined me and continues to watch every week, whether it's on time or if you watch at a later time. So thank you. It's much appreciated. Um, I have three things to give away. So normal giveaway rules must be 18 or have parents permission to uh, send me your address. Be a su subscriber, please. Um, I will send these anywhere in the world. Uh, with the understanding that it could take a while to get anywhere international. Um, these are all from my stash, things that I like, but I don't think that I'm ever going to get the chance to stitch, so I want to find a good home for them. So the first one is the 365 cross stitch designs from 2014. So we will show you up close. There's some cards there. These are all sizes. Smalls and larges. I'll show you the table of contents too, because sometimes not everything's on the cover. So this is from 2014. It was originally $16. There's a really nice um, Joan Elliott Santa and Snowman. There's a D-Day Remembrance piece, an alphabet with uh, gingham letters and cherries. Some wedding designs for cards. Birds and other animals for... I'll show you a close-up of this one. This is one of the big reasons that uh, I got the card, those animals. I'll flip to that page. And then this beach sampler. Let me show you that banner. 
the really cute woodland animals. So there's a little skunk, a rabbit, a squirrel, an owl, a fox, and then what's the other one? I don't know what this guy, this little guy is down there. It's hard to see when I'm... So this one, if you're interested in it, um, include the year 2014 in your comment. Okay. Again, it's pretty thick. So this, it has three, it says 365 patterns. So bound to find something that you like. 2014 ultimate cross stitch cards. So these are all very small designs. You can use as, um, as smalls or as cards, little ornaments. I'm trying not to get glare at the same time. Some father's day designs, special wishes. Purses, some lavender designs, some shopping girls, and then I'll show you the table of contents. This one says 225. You already saw the lavender. I actually stitched up the basket full for my mom. Her birthday card. Some teddy bears and a kitten. It's hard to see what I'm doing. So this one, if you're interested in it, original price $15. Again, it's also pretty thick. Um, lavender. Use the keyword lavender somewhere in your comment if you're interested in that one and the next one is another ultimate cross stitch cards from 2016 trying to get it to focus there's some pretty silhouettes there some birthday gifts flowers and hearts Caterpillars, some birds, let's see, oh this, this one isn't on, this isn't on the cover or the table of contents, but it's geese and flowers. Carousel horses. Uh, sorry, if that's making you dizzy. Okay. So for this one, if you're interested in it, use the keyword flowers because of the flowers here on the front cover. So those are three giveaways for you. I will uh, draw uh, random using those keywords two weeks from now. So that's going to be what, like the 15th of March, whenever that Monday is. Um, so two weeks, if you are interested in any of those three big magazines. And that is it for my stitching content. Thank you for joining me if that's all you're interested in. Next, we have life updates and an Air Force story. Life updates, we got six inches of snow last week in one day, so that was pretty fun. It was a very wet and heavy snow. Um, the kids had a lot of fun playing in it and building snow forts and such. Um, it was not a good day for flying. My husband was supposed to fly that day, and it didn't happen because they couldn't keep up with cleaning the uh, ramp and the runways and taxiways, and also the one de-icing truck that was trying to keep two D-52s free of ice. By the time it got done with one, it had to go back to the other because the de-icing liquid on the wings of the jets had frozen. It's not supposed to do that. Um, so they had a weather cancel on that day. And then the, the other life update is things have gotten very exciting all of a sudden. My husband may have had his last flight on the B-52 for a while because um, he has 
what's called a PCA, permanent change of assignment, which means you're not moving, but they're um, changing your job at the base that you're currently at. So we did this a lot as maintenance officers and you do it um, depending on your career field. You may do it more than others um, and it's for professional development, help you grow as an officer and also to help the unit, help the wing that you're at. Well, there's a unit here that is in need of some assistance and the current wing commander worked with my husband um, when they were deployed so they know each other. He knows uh, my husband can do a good job when it comes to fixing some things and, and getting units ready for things. And so he just put two and two together and said, congratulations, you're going to fix my problem uh, before the wing goes through a big inspection in a couple of months. So uh, unit needs help in order for the whole wing to be ready for the inspection in a couple of months. And now it's on my husband's shoulders. So I don't know if he's going to be flying because he's going to be busy getting everything ready for that inspection. We'll see. It'll be exciting. Flexibility is the key to air power. So, okay. Um, one side note before we get to the Air Force story, it's kind of Air Force related. Uh, if you watch the news, you saw that uh, the U.S. had an airstrike in Syria last week um, to some Iranian-backed militias. That was these guys right here. Uh, my former unit, the 335th Fighter Squadron, uh, they are currently deployed out of Seymour Johnson in North Carolina. So they are in theater, as we say. They're over there in the desert. And they were the ones that were tasked with carrying out the airstrike. So they used some 500-pound uh, precision-guided bombs uh, to take care of those targets. So, And I found out about it once it hit the news, just like everybody else. Okay, the Air Force story for the day is all about the X-15. Now let me show you a close-up of an X-15. This was the first space plane, if you will. Now, the X-15 flew for almost 10 years total and set many records. Uh, it set the uh, speed record at 4,520 miles per hour, which is Mach 6.7, and it flew at 353,000 feet to investigate hypersonic flight. Now, when I uh, talked the other day about, or a few weeks ago, about the SR-71, they were flying up to 80,000 feet at Mach 3.2 or 3.3. So this is going higher and faster, but the SR-71 is still the fastest airplane because this one doesn't take off from the ground. This is a space, space vehicle, if you will. It's a rocket. It's not a plane in the traditional sense of the word. So the SR-71 is still the fastest airplane. This is different. So when we're talking about hypersonic flight, they are um, talking about between Mach 5 and Mach 10. SR-71 only flew to Mach 3.2 or 3.3. Um, the 199 missions that the X-15 flew contributed to the uh, development for the Mercury program, the Gemini program, Apollo program, and the Space Shuttle program. So this was like a test plane, hence the X, that they uh, NASA flew to conduct all kinds of experiments based on the airframe to learn about stresses at speed and at temperature and altitude, um, learn about what kind of coatings they can use. This is how they developed the first pressure suit. Um, so they, they had three of these X-15s made. As I said, 199 missions. It flew from 1959 to 1968. There was only 12 pilots that were ever flew on this. Um, and they were a combination of, there were some from NASA, some from the Air Force, some from Navy. And uh, the aircraft was made by North American Aviation. So there was one pilot from their uh, company. They flew a very small part of the globe. Um, so they launched off a of B-52, which I'll show you pictures of. 
um, and they flew two different flight paths. It was either um, fly uh, at a level altitude and conduct experiments based on speed, or to go at extremely high rate of climb to get as high as you could and then descend. Um, the rocket that propelled this uh, aircraft could only, like it burned through fuel like no, like super fast. Even once they added um, external fuel tanks to add more fuel, that only provided like 60 more seconds, so another minute. So the rocket engine, once it launched from the B-52, only burned for 80 to 120 seconds, so two minutes. And if it had those external fuel tanks, it could go for three minutes. And then they they glided, so without power, for 8 to 12 minutes before um, gliding into a landing. So no power. Um, and a dry lake bed near to Edwards Air Force Base in California. Okay, so if you see this X-15, they had no way to steer... That nose wheel did not turn. And instead of rear landing gear, it had skids, like skis, on it. So, let me show you. Here is, I have other pictures too, the wing of the B-52 and how it was mounted up under the wing of the B-52. And then the they would fly to... Uh, 45,000 feet, going about 500 miles per hour, and then they would disconnect and launch their rocket. Where's the other pictures I want? So here's another picture. You will see this one has a white appearance and it has the external fuel tanks. Um, they use this white coating they were trying out different coatings to see what could deal with the temperatures, as we talked about with the SR-71. Um, the X-15 was mainly titanium, but they tried this alloy, which was a, a nickel chrome alloy, alloy over the titanium. So, and then those are the external fuel tanks. Look how big they are, and that only provided another minute of flight. So let me show you a flight map. For Americans, you can figure this out. So here's Las Vegas, Edwards Air Force Base, Los Angeles is to the south. So the B-52 would drop them and they'd either go um, keep the same altitude and go for speed before coming into land. Or the B-52 would launch them over here and they'd go up as high as they could before coming down to land. So very simple flight path. With the, their only mission was to try out, you know, do all kinds of experiments, take all kinds of measurements from that airplane, and uh, record the results so that they could develop uh, what they needed for the space program. So there is the body of the B-52 taking off. They're just off the ground with the X-15 off the wing. So... Let's see what other pictures do I have. Here's another wing shot where he just dropped and the rocket is starting to fire. Just interesting to note, you see the curvature of the wing of the B-52. All airplanes wings flex, but depending on the plane, they, they have different uh, degrees of flex once they're airborne. Let's see, I showed that one. And, like I said, there was only 12 pilots. And, let's see, uh, like five or six of them were from NASA. You might recognize this person. That's Neil Armstrong. He flew seven missions on the X-15. So, and that gives you a good uh, size relation, too, for the size of the aircraft compared to a, a person. Let's see. Um, there, 
as I said, there was uh, three X-15s. There was one fatality. Um, in 15 November 1967, Major Adams, um, he was doing one of those high elevation, high altitude flights. And he got into a Mach 5 spin at 230,000 feet. They had no procedures to recover the aircraft from here. And nothing I read said anything about uh, ejection seats. He tried to recover the aircraft, but at 65,000 feet, at Mach 3.9, the aircraft broke up and spread considerable distance before it crashed uh, back on the surface of the earth. So that was one fatality. Uh, that leaves two X-15s remaining once they were retired in 1968. Uh, one of them is at the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and the other is at the uh, Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. So that is your Air Force story of the day. I will link below a video of um, that gives probably a better organized uh, information about the X-15 if you are so inclined and interested in seeing some footage of it actually flying instead of just still pictures. So uh, check out that link below if you're interested. Everybody have a happy uh, or a good stitching week and we'll see you later. Good luck with your history sprints. Um, bye guys.